again. Uh, our next presenters are Eva and Christina, and they're going to be telling us about the meta-substituted uh, amtocrine analogs and are used as potential uh, tumor treatment drugs. So let's uh, welcome Eva and Christina. <laughs> I'm Christina and I'm Eva. And for the past five weeks, we've been evaluating meta-substituted L-benzyl and nine-prime acridinol hydroxylamines as potential anti-tumor agents. And so we'll be sharing this information with you guys today. Okay. okay. So cancer is an abnormal growth of cells that impede the health of the individual. This abnormal growth results in too many harmful cells in the body. All cancer cells have a similarity that they all at an increasingly uncontrollable rate in the body. Several drugs have been created to retard the rate of the replication. However, parts of the drug can have negative effects on the human body, yet they can be harmful to non-cancerous cells in the body. Common cancer treatments include radiation and chemotherapy. One type of cancer treatment includes drugs that bind to the DNA molecule and prevent DNA transcription and replication, leading to cellular apoptosis. These types of compounds allow for the cell replication to be more controlled, which means that the cancer cell growth is still controlled. Cancer treatments of this type include compounds that are able to um, intercalate DNA. Intercalation is a term first coined by Leonard Thurman, where acridines, specifically nine amino acridines, can bind to DNA between the alternating base pairs, and they're inserted into the DNA phosphate backbone. These acridines can also be called mutagens, which can change the DNA molecule and cause mutations. The DNA also develops an altered function that is original. This is because the intercalation agents have substituent groups which are exposed. Due to electronic properties, the molecules interact differently with other molecules in the body. The whole complex is able to interact with the enzyme capoisomers to which normally cleaves the DNA strand. But when it is involved in the um, drug DNA enzyme complex, its function in the renewing process of DNA, which is the process where two strands of DNA are bound back together, does not occur. This results in the DNA being cut in multiple locations, which makes the DNA unsalvageable, which leads to the apoptosis of the cell. N-amitocrine has a unique intercalation and enzyme to, sorry, topo isomers to interactions. n amitocrine's effects are more successful than o amitocrine and p amitocrine While effective, n amitocrine is susceptible to a nucleophilic attack, which is when a nucleophile or a chemical species that is able to generate electrons, a toxic positive or partly positive charge in the atom to replace the leaving group such as a halide. This susceptibility causes the compound to metabolize rapidly, that when the compound is administrated to the patient, it requires a high dosage due to the short half-life. This administration of large doses of the medication can be harmful to the body, causing a medical implication that can worsen the health of the patient, leading to large amounts of the potentially harmful metabolism. When a treatment is given to the patient, the compound as a whole may appear sick. However, when the compound is broken down, the molecules may interact with the body harmfully. It is thought that the presence, that the presence of hydroxylamines linking to the group as an O-benzyl N9 prime acrogenyl hydroxylamine. Okay, so this research, we're trying to improve the therapeutic compound's ability to bind to the DNA and its effectiveness, along with the stability under uh, physical, physiological conditions. So up here, we have an O-benzyl and 9 prime acridinol hydroxylamine, and this is the benzene ring that's the benzene ring that's on it. And we have the R1, R2, and R3 groups. And so the R1 group is the ortho series, and the R2 group is the meta series, and the R3 group is the para series. And so for this research, we tested the meta series, and we tested the substituent groups on the benzene ring, and we put in the compounds 3 nitrobenzyl chloride and 3 chlorobenzyl chloride. And so these here are the products, the final products that we would have uh, using our compounds. So for our methodology, uh, this is essentially a three-step reaction with the three arrows and starts with the creation of the cisalamide. And then after we have the cisalamide, we would go to a proton and a mark to confirm our uh, results. And then we would perform an acid, acid reflux along with other steps to create the salt, and then after the salt, we would uh, use another compound and combine it with uh, these other reactants to create the final product. So for the cisalamid creation, we used uh, sodium bicarbonate, deionized water, dipolomethane, 
uh, tetrabutyl ammonium hydrogen sulfate, and I use nitrobenzyl chloride, and Eva used uh, chlorobenzyl chloride, and we mixed those together and stirred and heated that to reflux. And what a reflux is is that it's a distillation technique that it involves uh, vapors condensing. So uh, while the solution was at reflux, we added anhydroxy hydroxy and we dissolved that over a period of time. And then following that, we extracted the solution with dichloromethane spice along with washing it with uh, sodium bicarbonate deionized water hydrochloric and hydrochloric acid. And after that, we dried it over anhydrous uh, sodium sulfate, and the solvent was removed through a rotary evaporator. And this is the drawing of the uh, reaction. So we have all these compounds that I just mentioned up here, and it results in this phenomenon. So these are images of our uh, first step process. So this is the container that uh, has the free nitrobenzyl chloride, and this is the round bottom flask that it flask that includes the compounds that I just mentioned, and this was before it was uh, heated to reflux, and then this is the extraction that we performed, and then this is the rotary evaporator that we used to remove the solvent. So for our salt creation, we took glacial acetic acid and hydrochloric acid and we added it to the product, and then after that we heated that to reflux. and. Uh, Hydrochloric acid was pipetted while the solution uh, was in reflux. And following that, we used a uh, rotary evaporator to collect the product. And then we added uh, deionized water to create a suspension. And the suspension solution, we tested that for alkalinity uh, using wetness paper and 10% um, sodium hydroxide. And following that, we extracted the dichloromethane again and dried it over in hydrous sodium sulfate and the excess acid, so the glacial acetic acid and the hydrochloric acid were removed through a rotary evaporator. And then we uh, completed a gravity filtration, and following that, we treated the solution with uh, hydrochloric, a hydrogen chloride gas bubbling to achieve the product. And once again, this is the reaction that we have resulting in the salt. So these are images, sorry, these are images of uh, the step of the reaction. And so this is the acid reflux. And this is the suspension solution. So it's the product plus the deionized water. And then after that, we have the product that was dried over uh, sodium sulfate. And then following that, we have the gravity filtration and then the treatment with the hydrogen chloride gas bubbling. So this is our final compound creation reaction, and we weren't able to complete this due to our time constraints of the program. But what it would have done is that it would have underwent another reaction with solid 9 chloroacridine which is this molecule, and solid uh, potassium carbonate along with crystal phenol. And then you would mix all of those at a temperature of approximately 80 to 100 degrees Celsius for about 6 to 8 hours. And following that, it undergoes a, radial a, radial a process called radial chromatography, and that would purify the compound to create. Okay, for viscosity testing, we use UV spectrometer, and we use spheres mod. Uh, it's, okay, um, we're just going to read this to you. Yeah, okay, uh, so spheres mod is A equals epsilon BC, and so A stands for absorbance, epsilon stands for molar absorbity, and B stands for coupling, and C stands for molar concentration. And so then we created four solutions. Um, one is untreated geomimic um, cast thymus DNA. The second one is unsubstituted O benzyl N9 hydrogenyl hydroxamine. The third one is O3 methyl benzyl N9 times. Acridino hydroxamine, and the fourth one is O3 chlorobenzyl and nine prime acridino hydroxamine. And we created the first two as a basis so we can compare our next compounds with the substitutions. Okay, so then we um, had a pH 7 phosphate buffer containing 5% DMSO dilution, and we put it in a volumetric flask and we just fold it up to the like line, and we have DNA solution, and then we mix them together and put it into a viscometer, and we tested the viscosity five times for each solution. 
So they did a viscosity test because the greater the viscosity for the solution, it means the greater affinity it has, the compound it has to bind to the DNA, and that's what we want. So what a viscosity test is, is that you take the DNA growth solution and you pipette it into this tube that contains this uh, bulb, and then you would fill up the DNA growth solution until between these two lines. And then to actually create the, to actually do the test, you would put your finger over this tube right here, which is kind of back right here in this image, and then you would use a bowl and you would uh, draw up the solution until it reaches to about this bowl here. I know it's a little, it's slightly difficult to see. And then you would wait until the solution uh, flows down until it hits this line. And after it hits this line, you're going to time the, uh, the you're going to time how long it takes for the solution to travel from this line to this line about to this line right here, and then that would be your average flux time, which I'll explain later. But then, what I want to show you guys is that this is the solution containing the three nitrobenzyl chloride, and as a result from or what we observed from the viscosity test, uh, there was a precipitate in here which uh, affects our results. That we'll mention later. So for our results and discussions, we so overall we selected the compounds from the meta series substituent groups of the L-benzyl and 9-primacridone hydroxylines, and these molecules were prepared using the processes by Bonacorzi and Georgi. And the data was collected for the L-benzyl and 9-primacridone hydroxylines, and they were synthesized with three chlorobenzyl chloride and three nitrobenzyl chloride. And I just want to say that following the gravity filtration for the solution containing the three nitrobenzyl chloride. Uh, it was treated with the gaseous hydrogen chloride, and then so a precipitate was supposed to form. However, with my solution, it didn't form. So we retried, so we tried uh, putting it through the rotary evaporator again, and we did a second extraction. However, the precipitate still did not form. So every, uh, so every step afterward, we used a previously prepared and purified uh, solution to complete the rest of the steps. However, uh, as a uh, precipitate, precipitate of the three, of the O3 chlorobenzyl, hydro, chlorobenzyl hydroxylamine hydrochloride was observed. So this is my uh, proton NMR of the, of my cytalamate containing the three nitrobenzyl chloride. And what a proton NMR is, is that it helps so it has like the hydrogen nuclei, nuclei shown up here, and then it helps um, you determine the structure of the compound that you're testing. So I have um, my compound here, the cytomas, and then so over here, there's supposed to be eight hydrogens, and then two over here. So if you count one, two, three, four, uh, these, these two are from this one, and then five, six, seven, eight. So it, it's just a confirmation that we actually made what we were supposed to make. Okay, so this is the NMR of mycophalamid. Um, so over there are my hydrogens, and it's showing that I had 13 hydrogens when there's only supposed to be eight. And so we're assuming the other ones are from the n hydroxypathalamid which was put into the reflux but didn't fully dissolve. Sorry. Okay, so this is the table that we created based on our viscosity measurements. And uh, first of all, viscosity is the fluid's resistance to flow and the efflux time and the time it takes for the fluid to flow. So here you can see that the electron is drawing substituent groups that have a higher viscosity compared to the standard solution. And this indicates that it has a greater, um, it's more effective in its ability to bind to the DNA. And so using uh, the efflux, the average efflux times, we were able to determine the kinematic viscosity. And to do that, you would multiply the efflux time by the viscometer constant. And for this research, the viscometer constant was 0 0.005057. And so once again, you can see that the kinetic viscosity is greater um, for, uh, for both the metastasis compounds. And it also indicates that it has a greater affinity for binding to the DNA. And the units here is uh, millimeters or millimeters squared 
our second. Okay, so these are our thermal denudation graphs. So the geomet cast sinus of the DNA was our standard and was used to compare the results. The inflection points of the thermal denutrition graphs are the melting points for the solutions. The melting temperature of the DNA solution was increased when in the presence of each of the aquidine compounds, while O3 nitrobenzyl N9 prime aquidino hydroxamine has a relatively high viscosity. It can be evaluated with a it cannot be evaluated with a thermal denutrition graph because it tends to precipitate. The precipitate affects the absorbance, creating a shape that shows that O3 nitrobenzyl N9 prime hydroxyl I mean, aquadino hydroxamine is not viable in the aqueous environment. And yeah, that one's my thermal denutrition graph, and it just shows that it has a high melting point, which means it's good in an aqueous environment, and that it's effective in its ability to bind with DNA. So this is a choose-off plot, or a quality structure activity relationship plot. And we determined this plot using known Hammett sigma values, along with the thermal denutrition data and the viscosity data that we collected earlier. And briefly, have a sigma value. They're known constants for the substituents on the benzene ring. And we can observe that the placement of the substituent group it enhances the acridine compound's ability to bind to the DNA. And in comparison to the acridine compound that was with the compound uh, with just the hydrogen at the same position, it's it's better. I think so better. Okay. So then, this is the three. This is the O3 chloroben benzyl uh, and 9 prime acridinal hydroxylamine. And because it's at the vertex of the parabola, that shows that it's, it can be observed that it has a great binding affinity. So for our conclusion, so based on the thermal denaturation data and the viscosity data, we determined the effectiveness on uh, how our synthesized compounds were able to bind to the DNA. So the thermal denaturation cues our plot and the kinematic viscosity cues our plot. They both uh, follow the same parabolic trend. Oh, here. And then, so for both plots, the O3 chlorobenzyl and 9 prime acridinal hydroxylamine, uh, the melting point was increased and the viscosity was greater than that of the DNA solution. And the O3 nitrobenzyl and 9 prime acridinal hydroxylamine. <coughs> and it shows that the, it shows that the chloro substituent, it has it's more effective in increasing the binding affinity of the compound compared to the nitrous substituent at the third position. And this proves that like both withdrawing, both electron uh, withdrawing substituent groups, uh, specifically the solutions containing the three chlorobenzyl chloride and the three nitrobenzyl chloride, they're both better at binding with the DNA than the hydrogen substituent on the benzene ring. Oh, so these are references. Um, if you guys have any questions about them, you can come talk to Evan and I later on after the presentation. And we wish to acknowledge the, well, I wish to acknowledge the financial assistance of Excel Energy. And I wish to acknowledge the financial assistance of Noble Energy. Um, we would like to thank uh, the University of Northern Colorado for allowing us to use uh, their facilities in such as the organic lab and the dorm and the dining hall and such. And we would also like to thank the Frontiers of Science Institute for providing us a unique opportunity to do research over the summer because I know a lot of students don't get to have this chance to work under or to help others um, do research projects. And we would also like to thank our advisor, Sean Hoskins, the Mosher Research Group, and our mentor, Alyssa Carlson, because without their support and their mentoring, we would not have been able to create this presentation or um, even this research. And